Hi, I'm Frank Spidell, a retired emergency physician and recovering hospital administrator. Welcome to the Doctors Inn via Zoom during the Corona crisis of 2021. For our discussion today, I invite your robust doubt and skepticism. For as the great humanist and physicist Richard Feynman reminded us, science is the organized skepticism and the reliability of expert opinion, adding, I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. To Professor Feynman's invitation for skepticism, I would add the observation of the astrophysicist Carl Sagan. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Now, I am neither an epidemiologist, public health official, nor infectious disease specialist. Always defer for your healthcare guidance to your primary physician, your local and state health departments, and the CDC. As I wrote the introduction for today's show, we have lost more than 800, 485,000 Americans to COVID-19. And despite the underway vaccination program, I sense the fatigue of the pandemic is morphing into angry exchanges. Recent disagreement is being replaced by accusations. One may be labeled a science denier, denier and lectured about settled science simply for disagreeing. Amidst this head jolting fury, individuals and elected officials must respond to a killing pandemic. Any policy, no matter the craft and research and highest intentions will have con critics. Conflicting, challenging, changing policies may reflect contradictory, evolving understanding. For I don't think science has ever settled. The tenuous nature of what we know must always be in front of us. Since we've had writing and we've sat by the fires telling tales, the facts have changed in these tales. For the world is both obvious and deceptive and our understanding ever challenged. Since 1905, thanks to a patent clerk in Bern, we can no longer as an observer know with certainty which of two events came first. Since 1905, we have been forced to see a world that is at once and simultaneously both discrete and continuous. And science is ever mutating, and so are our understanding of the world must also ever be mutating. What enjoys our belief today is seen as an error tomorrow. Now there are truths in 2021 that we accepted in 1905. The speed of light in a vacuum is constant and independent of the speed of the observer, well, at least as I read this right now. Given science not being obvious and fixed, how do we find truth, the facts? Well, the technique of science. We observe, we codify, we record, we organize, we analyze, and then we publish. And simply being published in a world-respected journal does not mean we have presented truth. Lest we forget, Andrew Wakefield's hideous harmful paper linking autism to the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine was originally published in The Lancet, a respected journal. The Lancet retracted this foolery 12 years later. After publication, the game begins. We invite criticism and discussion of the publication. This is called peer review. For as the great Scott philosopher of the Enlightenment, David Hume, reminded us, truth springs from the arguments among friends. Published research showing our world is both poor and magnificent. Like the animals and animal farm, some research is more equal than other research. Underlying our search for the truth is the assumption that the author's data are real, not manufactured like the Wakefield data. Nor does the substance of the author's institution guarantee the provenance of the data. A former Harvard cardiology professor had more than 31 papers retracted because he manufactured the data he reported. Sadly, the desire for fame and funding may lead to bogus data and harmful publications. Would anyone be surprised that researchers funded by the maker of OxyContin found opiates had no significant risk of addiction for patients suffering from chronic pain? Nor do grants and cash alone make for bogus research. Influence and recognition too can drive poor research. So as we seek understanding uh, and how to respond to all our challenges, our language 
our language, our innocent language may also add and muddy our consideration of the issue. For language which ought to clarify understanding frequently spikes confusion. Words with precise meanings are often fouled by interplay with common idiom. What does accuracy mean? What does precision mean? Aren't they the same? Isn't accuracy and precision the same? And what does it mean to say that a test is accurate? What's this about sensitivity and specificity? And why are you asking all those questions about the prevalence? To sort through this, we have medical specialty societies and government agencies such as the CDC and NIH. Not surprisingly, the societies don't always agree. Want to start a debate without end? Ask if administering antibiotics before drawing blood cultures affects mortality rates. Nor do agencies get it right all the time. Nor are their statements always consistent. Consider the CDC. Remember the CDC's mandated test kits in February 2020 that didn't work? Or the CDC's habit-like musing on aerosol transmission of SARS-CoV-2? Um, don't tell them at that time there was an abundance of pre-COVID literature reporting and documenting aerosol transmission of respiratory viruses and organisms. I, I share this not to discredit the CDC. The CDC is our best, and it's dedicated to getting it right. But it's a human organization with all that implies. Nor do we have the luxury of time like a college storm debate. We must turn to agencies, society, and our own wits to light the way forward and formulate our responses. I am happy and honored today to have as our guest today, Professor David Rubin, Director of the CHOPS Policy Lab at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Professor of Pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine, the University of Pennsylvania. In producing this show, I am continuously educated and humbled by my guests who, like Dr. Rubin, are not just at the edge, but are the needed edge of our investigations. Penn Policy Lab did not just begin in 2020. It seems to me wondrous and remarkably prescient recognition of our society's needs for translational understanding of the tsunami of at times problematic publications. Uh, Dr. Rubin, welcome to the Doctor is In. And what did I get wrong? No, I just think it's you know I think I think it, you you had a nice <laughs> a nice introduction there thinking about just sort of how difficult it is to you know is to not you know is 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 to be a discerning customer in terms of when you're reviewing science and understand that even our most able institutions can sometimes get it wrong that the facts can change I think it, particularly with a novel coronavirus. Um, you know, I think it was Al, uh, John Maynard Keynes that said something to the effect, "When the facts change, I change as well." What do you do? What do you do, sir? Uh, and I think it's been hard for people to appreciate that things can change and, and try and discern when when we're looking at pure science or peer-reviewed science, or when politics sometimes creeps into um, uh, to decisions that are made with regards to you know uh, some of some of the scientific advice that's being given. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. You mean politics creeps into science and pronouncements? Yeah, it happens sometimes. <laughs> I think I, you know, having been around, you know, we, we started Policy Lab back in, in about 2007, 2008 um, with a vision of taking the science that we were collecting, particularly our public health work and our population science, uh, you know, uh, our, our real community engaged research that looked outside the hospital walls and said, you know, it, it wasn't sufficient just to simply publish them in a journal. I mean, it was important. It was, uh, I believe, in the process of peer review, uh, but it was also important to translate that information and also be circumspect as to its limitations. But if we could surround ourselves with public health lawyers and public policy folks and communications experts and psychologists and social workers, um, and community members, uh, you know, we could uh, potentially build something, you know, take what we were seeing at CHOP, align with the research that we were doing and be able to provide it to the public in a way that was digestible and allow for some, some what we hope were evidence-informed uh, policy or program decisions for children. Was there anything in particular, Professor, that, that, that got this started back in 2007? Was there any kind of like burning bush that made you say, hey, this is a, problem we got to address this 
Well, on the individual side, you know, I, you know, I think I've always considered myself a bit of a tweener. I, my early work, I worked directly with the child welfare system in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I got to know a lot of city officials back, you know, uh, during the first 10 years of my career. Um, and I just felt the need that, that, that there was a great divide between policy and pra uh, practice and the research side. And, um, and to me, it's, it's not that the evidence, you know, I didn't take our science too seriously to say we were truth but that I just hope to provide a venue uh, for, um, you know, for policymakers or program developers to use evidence. Uh, but I didn't place a value judgment on how they interpreted it. And I think that's a really important distinction. Um, the goal is to provide the information, uh, you know, but not necessarily to tell them what to do. They sometimes ask you. Um, and, uh, you know, and, but I think the most important is to garner their trust and to hope that they can at least interpret the information and then within their value system, try to make a better judgment about the next step ahead. And people with different, uh, different beliefs will make different decisions, but I was just happy as long as they were willing to listen and try to interpret it at least from their lens. Uh, and I think you, uh, it's needed. What, what the policy lab is doing is, how does a normal person, and by a normal person, somebody who does not have the, to read medical literature well, uh, is almost a, uh, something of medieval monks with candles to do. It, it's massively challenging. You know, as well as I do, there's some really bad stuff out there. And it's easy to walk down the path. So it's what you're doing is and, and honestly period. Just the word peer review does not necessarily get it right. I've seen uh, tons of papers published where, where uh, you're scratching your head and thinking, how did that get through peer review? Oh, but, but, I think the real peer review happens after the article has been out there. Yeah. And people have had a chance to chew on it and write those letters to the editor. Oh, by the way, um, that this is such a you. That's we're never finished, are we? Uh, no, I think you have to, you know, it's sort of, I, I see it as, as a sea of evidence. And what you're trying to do is, is, is recognize that no one paper speaks, uh, speaks with authority, but that it's, you have to interpret it in, in terms of the, the continuum of other related work to try to see, you know, this is the way my mind thinks, but where the probability structure is moving in terms of the certainty. Um, uh, Thank of, whether, you. of whether you think something is more opinion versus no, I think there's real fact here. I think there's a, 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 a body of evidence which, which would suggest that this is what's going on. But you're always questioning as to what am I missing? Why, you know, where is my confirmation bias? You know, sometimes you can have yes. a dissonance where you want to believe a certain outcome. Um, and you have to be very, very careful to not uh, fall prey to your own biases. I, I, Professor, I could not agree with you more, Dr. Rubin. Uh, I, I struggle, I struggle with this in myself that I've come to the article and I have my presupposition, and uh, I'm sort of scratching my head. Uh, when we look for confirmations of articles that may have a, a showstopper in them, uh, I always like to let a few years go by. We can't do that right now. You let a few years go by. We we don't have that luxury. We're it's it's not a bull party at a at a frat house. We've got to do something right now, and the the virtue of having tincture of time and having people repeat the observations, repeat uh, repeat the study. We don't have that, do we? No, no, we don't always have that. I mean, over time, you do. You know, you often uh, you get a preponderance of evidence, particularly around sort of uh, you know medications, vaccines, you know, you have a, a bunch of trials that can be organized into a systematic review, but often you don't. Um, you may have randomized trials and everyone considers randomized trials the holy grail, but randomized trials are like lab experiments and they don't all, they don't always translate to the real world. And so, you know, uh, you know, nor can you, we do, nor can we do them ethically on occasions. That's correct. And sometimes, you know, for example, even now as we're doing the vaccine studies in children, we're not looking for efficacy. We're just looking for equivalence um, because I don't think it would be ethical not to provide a vaccine uh, to a child and to provide a placebo uh, in, you know, given the efficacy data we've already seen for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Uh, yeah. And I think that uh, I, every people ask me, I'm sure they ask you constantly, I have no problem with getting the vaccine. If I ever get the vaccine, I have no problem with that. Of all the things I worry about, that's not one of them. 
I concern more about a drunk driver taking me out than I am a significant problem with the vaccine. Mm -hmm. The mRNA vaccine or, or a seismic change in a moving joint. So what is ACIP? I keep seeing those letters. Who are they? ACIP, they're an advisory group to the CDC that uh, provides advisory recommendations on the safety and efficacy of vaccines and, and vaccination schedules in the country. Um, that's their primary responsibility. They're composed of people from outside the CDC or nominated and vetted and, and are the expert panel, uh, if you will, that reviews data and provides recommendations back to the CDC. So they're, they're not part of the CDC. They're not a rubber stamp. They look at things completely independent from the CDC and make an advice. Yeah, that's the intent is, is to be people who are outside. Now, they all have a, there are relationships there, but I believe that, you know, knowing some of the people over the years, including my friend, Dr. Offit, um, who have been on the ACIP, uh, they're very independent minded individuals that are really, really take their job seriously in terms of weighing the safety data, the efficacy data, and thinking about vaccination schedules in this country. Very important group. I, I and I think it's underappreciated that there are people that are independent of the CDC slash NIH who look at this stuff. Yes. And uh, they don't, they don't, they may have their own views, but they don't bring a lot of baggage. That's correct. And uh, I think in this case, it, you know, the ACIP is a nice group. It works well. It's one of those uh, uh, bodies related to government that I think actually serves an incredibly important purpose in this country and, and is a very independent minded group. Uh, so you touched on this earlier, Professor, that our, uh, we have different kinds of trials that kind of have hierarchies of uh, reasonableness, one might say, or surety. I don't know the right word for it, but I feel more comfortable if I can see a randomized double-blind controlled trial going forward mm -hmm. than consensus of experts. Uh, I always get panicked when I start seeing consensus of experts. Uh, it's Sometimes it's the best we have because we don't have anything else to, you know, we Mm -hmm. Someone like the ACI, we get people together who have looked at this for not just two weeks, but for 20 years and say, what do you think about this study? Did I phrase that right? Yeah, I mean, I think that you have different levels of evidence. I mean, I've, you know, and I've seen the whole gambit. I think, you know, when you look at immunizations like SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, I think it works very nicely that the, the hierarchy of trials um, and how you weigh that evidence doesn't always work as well when you're thinking about community-based interventions or a decision of whether to open schools during the pandemic. Like there is no randomized trial that's going to help you and you're really trying to sift through evidence, some of which is peer reviewed, some of which is anecdotal. Um, and it can be very, very challenging. But with regards to the, you know, the top of the food chain, if you will, the immunization uh, you know, recommendations, I do think that that there's a there's a a real hierarchy of data that's used to inform those decisions. Uh, it, I, I, and I, as it should, because, you know, immunizations, we're taking a well person and doing something to them, which is a little bit different than treating somebody with acute asthma. Uh, you mentioned school openings. Bless us and keep us. There's enough here to, to write books on. In the summer, the American Academy of Pediatrics, kind of out of the blue, wrote uh, actually two separate statements saying we got to get kids back in school mm -hmm. and they kind of highlight this is going to be a risk reward decision process and not having kids in school causes problems and some of these problems may be long-standing and as some people have pointed out that i respect the problems in not having kids in school it's it's what they call a regressive policy that mm -hmm. families that are least able to provide the educational resources that a person may need growing up are the ones most hurt by this. And uh, I have a friend uh, whose children are in private schools, has not missed a day. We all can't have private schools. we got to do something. And the challenge I found, and please give me real feedback, was yeah. when uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out, they had, they said, we can't, it's, it's a question of goals. He said, you know, we, we cannot, we, the important thing is we, we can mitigate what happens. We're not going to eliminate the risk. I think they have language just like that. And they had some guidelines that were kind of, kind of guidelines. Um, one of the things that has people reaching escape velocity is 
the American Academy said three to six feet separation where possible. And then all of a sudden, we have gotten ourselves to the stage where people are saying, unless it's six feet, you can't have in-person classes. And I'm thinking, what study did the, it must be six feet, was it 6.0 feet plus or minus 0.2 feet? Or where did that absolute six foot standard come from? As opposed to the first thing I read was the American Academy, which was kind of, yeah, you know, we, we got to do this. And last I'll throw out about that. Have you seen any place where standards talk about air exchanges? You know, you know, it's interesting. You're covering a lot of terrain here, and I think it's. A, I think the school opening policy. I mean, it, you know, this is a great example where you had to. You know, there there are two. I, I view it as an X versus a Y. You have <laughs> for what data do we have, and that data is changing every day. Yes. And then where we are in the pandemic, uh, in terms of risk, um, because you know, to me, a good. Uh, you know, in terms of your your tolerance for risk. You know, it's very different if you're looking at this in November when when this thing blew in like a hurricane right after Halloween into the Philadelphia region versus now, right, where we have declining transmission. Um, and we're looking forward to a spring where we're seeing declining transmission and your tolerance for risk changes. But then you have information in terms of uh, fr from, from the region, from across the country uh, yeah, that you're sifting through. A lot of these are anecdotal or descriptive reports. Very few are peer reviewed, and even the peer reviewed reports have lots of limitations. You're hearing things about Europe, and so you're trying to sift through this to try to find the middle ground. Now, in terms of the six feet, um, you know that's you know we've supported the six foot recommendation to the great extent, greatest extent possible since the beginning, particularly at a time when we knew that we were about to go through a major surge uh, in the fall and winter. That and as we reopen schools in the fall. We were very careful because we knew that as we built disease burden, particularly uh, uh, among the community and kids included, uh, that eventually this would spill over with seasonal transmission into a very difficult um, winter. The six feet is based on the nature of, of how this virus spreads, which is principally a large droplet um, transmission. Secondary attack rates of this virus, sort of in the 15 to 30 percent range within a household are not measles, and I, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, that's what, you know, uh, Dr. Oppert would say to me all the time and my, and my infectious disease colleagues, you know, that if you're in a home with measles, it's going to spread, it's aerosolized, it's going to spread, um, but this is more large droplet, which is based on sustained exposure and close proximity. Now, nothing is absolute, but that's, a, but the older studies uh, looked at the dispersion of, of large respiratory droplets and that, and, and they mostly disperse within six feet. And that's where that six foot came from. It's not an absolute. And I think I like the language six feet to the greatest extent possible. I think that actually the, the, the assumption of going down to three feet, particularly earlier in the pandemic, um, was based on the knowledge that many schools could not offer uh, for at least full instruction to their students unless they were able to go down to that, uh, that footage. But that wasn't based on science. That was based on sort of... Uh, uh, the need to try to think about where we could blend things. Now, the addition of masking, the big question that still remains today is the addition of masking, how much does that confer additional protection when you do go down below six feet? And uh, and that's been, I, I think, the continued source of, of controversy and scientific speculation. Uh, you know, I think that they, we have a lot of data that our, our, our school plans have worked extremely well, some, some in districts, particularly at the elementary school level. Uh, that um, that kids have been fairly safe because the younger kids are inefficient drivers of transmission. They're cohorted into 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 the same class. So I think the the gathering evidence would suggest that all elementary schools have been fairly safe. But we've had a lot of challenges in middle and high school. I think the older kids, you know, are transmitting very similarly to adults. They've also been a you know huge source of community burden for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, when you look at the English data, which was sobering, is right around the week that a group up in Harvard came out with recommendations to go down to three feet immediately. That was the week that the that England uh, closed its schools because they had evidence that these new strains were spreading very fast uh, through the UK and they were principally spreading it in, in, in children, uh, adolescents and young adults. And so, you know, what you hear on the news um, is is often, or what you might hear in in opinion pieces, 
is often not inclusive of the public health data that people have uh, from their contact tracing, which recognizes that transmission can occur. And so how do you sift through that data when you're trying to advise school districts um, about how to play the middle and, and what, their, what their own temperature is for risk in terms of getting kids back to school? That's been the art of this the entire time. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I'm so glad we're doing the show. I'm, I'm learning all the time. Uh, let's go. Uh, the, there's a study. It's the only study I've known that showed this. And I'm sure you know the literature better than me. By, uh, I think it was Park in Korea. Okay. Published, published something in CDC that said, oh, uh, kids are... Uh, uh, High school kids, they're big spreaders. They're bigger spreaders than adults. And uh, I was a little bit surprised that has that study been repeated anywhere? And the other. Yeah, go ahead, finish your. And the other thing about that is uh, that study is really, that is an anomalous data point because they looked at household contacts and then they looked at uh, non household contacts and they did their tracing. And uh, the non-household contacts, as they broke it out for age groups, it just goes up like it expected it would. Uh, except for the household contacts, it spikes larger than the highest recording they have. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of piece of data that I would think you'd have a little, let's repeat the study and see what the repeat looks like. Yeah. Because there's been a lot of policy based on this one, and that's not peer reviewed, is it? It's just a CDC public. A lot of the stuff appears on preprint websites now, and yes. so it's, it's very hard. I mean, you could you could extrapolate. There's been a lot of news in this country the last couple of weeks about variant strains and how uh, you know potentially a quote hurricane is coming ashore, uh, ashore with the growth of these variant strains. When in actuality, the data is, is showing declining transmission in every state in the country. Um, right now and and the study that they referred to is one out of Florida that said that that the variant strains are double quote doubling every 10 days well if you actually looked at that preprint which has not <laughs> been peer reviewed what's doubling is the proportion of viral isolates that are identified as these strains but the absolute number of viral isolates are going down and yeah. so you know so that to me would not have stood the test of peer review to say that there's a doubling going on here you know, if you start with 200,000 and you drop to 100,000, but you, the proportion of the isolates doubles, you actually haven't changed a thing. It's it's a one to one ratio, yeah, and uh, and so you know the you know most that was missed in all the reporting um, across the country. Um, the the headline was you know the variant strains are doubling, and that's why what you're doing with the policy lab. This is such great service to the it's a needed service it's a needed innovation because people aren't equipped to look at it like that mm -hmm. we uh every day we're a carpenter every day i i i make philly cheesesteaks i've got things i'm doing i can't go through this and the the nuance of reported data is massively challenging very hard uh so uh, going back to the thing about uh, in some areas, the six foot thing is held as an absolute. Yeah. And kids, schools will not open because of this. I look at that and we have sort of like our own studies here in the United States that weren't sponsored, but are just observational studies. Correct. Florida. Has Florida been a disaster when they've had basically open schools from the start? Uh, you know, I would be careful. You know, someone plays the middle, you never make anyone happy, right? <laughs> um, Florida's had extremely high rates of infection. And the, the, the insidious thing about this virus is, is that, you know, as you got to really high rates of transmission, you know, contact tracing broke down. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, there's a three degrees of separation here, you know, uh, in terms of looking at sort of the role of, of transmission among children. Um, and adolescents in and the contribution to community transmission. Notice I didn't say schools, right? Um, yeah. And so you know, and so if a child infects their parents and their parents goes out have a th you know, with friends and that and 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 they're at dinner and and then the the friend gets infected and then goes visit their their mom, 
and their mom gets infected, ends up in the hospital and dies, it's very hard to source that back to the individual child. And so what I've learned is two things in this pandemic. And I think that it's, it's hard to message this. Kids can get this virus. Yes. Right? And this is where confirmation, no one wants to, there's a cognitive dissonance. Kids can get this virus. They can transmit this virus. Yes. But under the presence of strong safety protocols, we can provide a, still provide a safe environment for instruction in schools. Now, there may have been moments like in November and December where it made sense for everyone to take a pause because we were trying to slow down transmission at the Thanksgiving table or at the Christmas table. Um, but for the most part, we could get kids back into schools. And I think that the more you could layer on uh, your interventions, the more able you were to forgive some of the footage between students at a desk if people were wearing their masks appropriately. And now we've added a testing program to try to do weekly testing in the area so that we can allow schools to move back towards normal operations, recognizing that they're going to, you know, concede some risk as they move kids closer together within a school building. But we also are at a time that we've seen declining transmission, so there are less kids knocking at the door um, with infection. And so to me, I, you know, I, I think we've tried to make the, the problem I've had all along is people have tried to make judgments of what we should be doing during the entirety when I've always looked at this as six to eight week blocks. What should we do right now? Um, and based on the evidence that we have. And I think we're at a moment, you know, optimistically that I think we're going to see a lot of schools moving towards opening, even in our large cities uh, will begin to open. I think those who've already been hybrid, um, uh, you know, they're going to be moving towards more full operations. And we're going to be using testing to kind of definitively answer what is the risk Which in the testing? school. And, and that's real time data for each of these school districts to, to give them the knowledge that they need as to how well their safety plans are going. Which testing? Antigen testing? Yeah, we're using a combination of uh, point-of-care antigen testing and uh, and point-of-care molecular testing. So, you know, we're, we're we're providing them some antigen testing to screen the sick individual, uh, whether a staff or a child who uh, who comes to school well and maybe and maybe come down be sick during the day. Those things can create a lot of anxiety. Those situations, and if we can do a rapid test very quickly. Um, we can sort of decide which kids uh, need, uh, wh where we need to uh, quit quarantine and decision making, where we might just send the kid home or the staff member home and have them convalesce to go see their doctor for confirmation. Um, and then we do a weekly assurance test, similar to what they've done in the colleges, to start doing more full participation weekly testing of staff, of uh, high risk students like our athletes in the high contact sports, our kids in the music and theaters program. Uh, or special needs kids who can't mask or maybe distance during the day and provide them the weekly testing and, and try to identify earlier in convalescence some of those asymptomatic individuals um, and remove them before they can uh, really potentially be a source of outbreak. It's not viral elimination, it's viral reduction. Um, and then we use the uh, molecular point of care test to confirm the positive so that we're not over calling false positives. I see what you're saying, uh, and the follow-up with the molecular test is almost an absolute. Mm -hmm. As if we're talking about testing asymptomatic patients right. with an antigen test, that uh, that's PPV is not exactly where we want to be on that. Well, uh, PPV de depends on the you know during de uh, November December PPV got a lot better. I can tell well, you, but, they, I, yeah, but not. But you're right. That's why we include it. So we have a false negative and a false positive problem, right? Yes, um, it's actually performed really well. Most of our positives have been confirmed uh, by our molecular point of care test. We use the Q, which is what the NBA uh, has been using uh, as its molecular test. It's a it's a point of care test. But you're right to say we were aware of the of the, of the unexpected what we call them the unexpected results the unexpected negatives, right? Should be confirmed with a molecular test. Like someone who has a COVID exposure comes up negative and is symptomatic should have that molecular test. Yes. And then the unexpected positives are your asymptomatics who turn positive, and then we have the molecular test. So it's been a nice model recognizing the concerns, like you said, about false positives and false negatives. Uh. Real quick, I know we're running out of time. I'll pick your brain. Uh, fomite transmission. I have been looking for a documented report of a fomite transmission. Help me out. Do I have to keep on looking till the end of days? Is there one out there? 
We have, you know, I, I think public health folks probably have uh, have have some evidence, but it's rare. And and honestly, you know, I think we we there are some things we've gone down a rabbit hole a bit. Um, and we'll talk about one of them is fomite transmission. I think you want to do good hygiene practice, good sanitation, uh, yes. and, and those types of things. But 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 you know, there are some extraordinary uh, things that some places were recommending to do. And and it to me, I think. Pragmatic is the name of the game here. I think that's also come up with respect to ventilation, um, uh, frankly, you know, and uh, look, ventilation is important um, and you do it if you can. I think there's simple things you can do like crack a window, put a fan in a room or open a door to a classroom. Um, but knowing that this is principally large droplet transmission, um, you, know, you know, we have to recognize similar to the six feet versus three feet discussion uh, that um, your primary interventions are really masking and distancing, right? And and how you accomplish that during the day and move kids around and your sick policy, keeping sick kids out of school. Um, that's probably 80, 90% of the value. And we can't use concerns about ventilation as a deterrent to providing in-school education for children. Um, you do it if you can, but it's not the primary intervention with the knowledge that this is principally a virus that is transmitted in close proximity with sustained contact. Uh, this is this has been wonderful. Uh, going forward, I come back to the American Academy and also to some early things that were were written in CDC about the if possible, where feasible for six feet. Yep. And I, I I I kind of feel comfortable with that. And I noticed something. Uh, God bless you guys down there at the Policy Lab. You you review and revise your material all the time. Uh, I was looking at your uh, November executive summary, and then there's a December publication about getting kids back in safely. And you said in there something which I was thrilled at, that you said this almost slavish obsession with community uh, incidents and uh, hospitalizations and things like that. Maybe that was, am I phrasing this right? The uh, language that you used, I think it was, uh, we have intentionally moved beyond absolutism of case incidents and test positivity thresholds. Although they were helpful for knowing how and when to start schools in late summers are no longer the most pressing questions. Uh, so that absolutism of uh, case incidents and positivity, uh, that's, well, what we learned, I think what we were referring to there, when we started this journey out, where there was very little knowledge on transmission, particularly in schools, we had the all, all we had was Europe back in the spring um, that pretty much opened at rates less than 10, 15 per 100,000 weekly. And so we were very careful in September, probably a little too careful because we just didn't want um, to expose kids to risk that was unforeseen. Um, we also had a, a, a bit of a Labor Day spike uh, towards the end of summer as, as a lot of that transmission was coming up from the south and people were finishing up the summer and, and gathering and doing, and, and doing those things. So we started out a little bit later, but what we found in the fall was obviously you had a lot of schools opening. Some didn't open. Some opened earlier, right around Labor Day or before Labor Day. And we, we learned to respect that every school is different. Um, that every school has its infrastructure, it has its uh, school community, its teachers, its uh, appetite for risk in terms of its school board and superintendents, um, its capabilities in terms of being able to pull this off. And, and that, um, that even in November and December, we had schools that breezed right through the worst part of this pandemic, uh, particularly our independent schools that had larger campuses and they were doing testing and were able to keep their schools open, but other schools that really struggled. And when you, the problem with going with the absolutism of, of thresholds is it doesn't respect um, the ability of uh, what I think of the local, the, the, how highly local um, this has been uh, in terms of interpreting uh, when schools should be open, what plans that they, they should provide. And so what we, we think of them as relative lane markers. So even the CDC guidelines that just came out that have thresholds, and we'll be talking about this this week, I, I see them as relative lane markers. The CDC's responsibility is to give people a relative sort of appraisal of where they balance the evidence. And to me, you know, every, uh, there's a lot of discussion about, well, <clears throat> returning kids to less than six feet or to six feet where, uh, wherever possible is, it should happen under 50 
per 100,000 per week. And a lot of people are critical because most counties in the country are not there, um, frankly, at this point. And so they were upset. But, you know, that recommendation probably makes a lot of sense for a large urban school district, but a suburban school district may have been doing well already and they and, and they and they can decide to continue to move on. And so I think it's we have to be careful to over scrutinize the thresholds, but we can't be beholden to them either. It's a piece of information. And I think of them in relative terms. And I also think of them in terms of the pandemic. Like, you know, so in November, December, um, when you're looking at six feet, when you're looking at literally what was a hurricane coming ashore the week after a Halloween. I mean, it changed dramatically. Our our positivity rates soared to near 20% of all our tests that we were doing at CHOP were positive uh, at our testing locations for SARS-CoV-2. That was not the time to be going down to three feet um, because there were just so much transmission. And so, you know, you know, understanding that that moment was a time to say, how do we protect these holidays and try to reduce what's about to happen in terms of intergenerational transmission, whether or not it was happening in school or at the activity right after school. And now is a different time. We're not looking at gatherings. Our case, our, our, we're declining transmission. And now I think we have more of an appetite to, to, to resume what we are doing. And I, and I think that it's okay to have changed and to be able to dial up and dial down interventions at individual schools during the pandemic and hopefully we're moving into a place now where we're on the back end of this and and the goal now is to get back to a normal school day yeah uh, i couldn't i appreciate exactly what you're what you're saying on that the uh, uh people have to make these decisions uh, are in a tough spot and i greatly value what what you're doing and what the policy lab is doing uh, one of the things that uh, I'm hearing is that uh, right now we're having a decreasing incidence throughout the country. Yep. It sounds like. Uh, it sounds like it's dropping. Uh, why that is, there'll be 8,000 reasons advanced. Somebody will say, I stripped naked, painted myself blue, and danced in the front yard. That caused it to drop. Uh, other people may say it's herd immunity. Lord knows. But apparently it is consistently. It is dropping right now. Uh, so I would think that would sort of argue we've got to get kids back into schools. Is is that a kind of fair? Interpret- yeah, let's well, to, to the declining transmission. I've been one of the folks out there that has not yet really overinvested in the concerns about the variant strains. I think that there's evidence that the innate property of the virus is more transmissible and may actually uh, pretend more severe disease. Um, I think there's some emerging evidence out of England and, and that I think in well-designed studies uh, would suggest that, but but I think what the the problem in terms of the messaging of that is that there's a lot of things that affect the transmissibility of a virus at a given moment in time, um, and the biggest is the seasonality of this virus, and uh, and there's also behavior. Obviously, if you had a big if you had uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas about to happen, that's a lot different than we are now, staring in the calendar, um, where the next event is probably. Um, St. Patrick's Day, and it's not a, a, an event that everyone participates in. Um, you know, so what I, you know, the seasonality of this virus is poorly understood. Some of it's temperature, some of it's probably UV and the, and the longer days, people going out, there's behavioral components of people moving outside and spacing out. Um, there's a lot of uh, aspects to seasonality, but it's a very strong influence in the models combined with immunologic protection, either through natural infection or acquired immunity uh, from the vaccine. And those forces are over, what I believe are overwhelming um, the proclivity of the virus to spread more easily uh, based on you know, uh, some of these variant strains. And that's what the data would show right now uh, in terms of what's, uh, of what's happening. And the quicker we can vaccinate and the quicker we can move towards spring, I suspect we're gonna see declining transmission as this virus becomes more endemic. So the conclusion would be, and now that we've had several weeks and already you know, there was a non peer reviewed model that came out the first week of the story about the variant strains that demonstrated we were going to have very high transmission through May. This was uh, produced by the CDC and it it came out and non-peer reviewed and it just wasn't true and it's already been shown not to be true and I think that now we've had several weeks we're close to March and we still not have have not seen those predictions come true and I think we have to start moving quickly to make plans to continue returning kids to the classroom I think it's okay to plan for something in early spring. And if for some reason we're wrong about our interpretation of the data, you can always slow down. Um, but schools need time to plan. They need to survey their school communities and make sure what the, you know, 
uh, that their school communities are comfortable with the plans to resume more normal school days. Uh, but I suspect we have a real opportunity here to start uh, to really uh, increase the number of children returning to school and get some schools, particularly elementary schools, back to full time. Understood. And I thank you for that observation. I'd, I'd like to close, and I cannot thank you enough, Professor. I'd like to close. I'm going to make a statement. I want you to comment on it. Uh, I think one of the challenges we have going forward is that goals. What is the intent of our policy? Sometimes we don't often specify well. And when we do specify them, we use words that are sometimes soft and interpretable by virtually anything. Uh, vaccination priorities, uh, healthcare providers uh, are in the 1A category. Mm -hmm. What's a healthcare provider? Boy, there's an art there. I can define anybody as being a healthcare provider. But we've got to get a policy and go forward with it. Goals. If our goal is to mitigate the transmission of the virus, is that different than a goal to contain the virus or to, uh, if we say we want to keep transmission as low as possible, doesn't that mean nobody goes to school? Because that's how you keep the transmission. Well, lockdowns, you know, the truth is lockdowns do work, but they come with an incredible cost, not just to our kids, but to our business owners, our restaurants. Um, and I think I, you know, I've always favored, I've had the opportunity to work with the task force uh, uh, with, with Dr. Burks in particular uh, while, uh, while she was at the task force. And I've always been one to, you know, the goal here was always to manage transmission. And, yeah. uh, and I think that people didn't quite understand that. The goal was not to, we, we never had a chance to eliminate transmission and it was try to balance and manage so that our hospitals wouldn't be overwhelmed, but give people the choices and the right information to manage their lives, get as many kids into school as we can, let our, our businesses try to limp along and try to get through this as safely as possible, to allow them to have some business. And we needed to do a little bit of all of that. And I think that was reflected in the way Dr. Burks and the task force tried to approach this. I mean, they, it was a very difficult situation. We're finding out in, you know, even in Europe where they started out looking much better than us, they've had a very, very difficult winter. Um, but I think now as I, as I look forward, I, there's just a lot of optimism now that we're opening up sectors of society. We're a little bit further along. And so there was a little bit of a grain of truth coming from every direction um, in terms of people's interpretation. Should we, should we keep our businesses open? Should we open our schools? Should we, um, should we uh, be out and about? I think that the one consistent piece of advice was the use of masks that would have helped, I think, through all of this, that if we were all wearing our masks and there was consistent messaging, I think it would have helped manage transmission. Um, but I think overall, we're looking forward, and I think there's a lot of optimism for folks out there that, uh, and certainly in our modeling team at CHOP and Penn, that we're moving in a good direction right now. And, and this is an event of a lifetime for all of us, our kids, our families. Um, and we're just hoping that the worst is behind us. Well, Professor Rubin, again, I cannot thank you enough, mm -hmm. not just for being a guest on the show, but for the work you're doing now at the Policy Lab. I, you are a brave person. I'm sure people throw stuff at you all the time. You're a better man than I am, Gunga Din. Uh, again, I want to thank you so much. In closing, the magnificent humanist physicist and writer Jacob Bernowski spoke of the hideous evil of the Holocaust, warning that when people believe they have absolute knowledge with no test in reality, this Auschwitz is how they behave, adding emphatically, Every judgment in science stands on the edge of error. Absolutism, dogmatism, certainty, these are the tools of zealots. These are the coin of the fanatic who unleash the worst while promising a better, safer world. We owe it to those who came before and who struggled with uncertainty and resisted those who knew with certainty our emulation. Wonderfully, Professor Bronowski offered the paradoxical quote of the Lord Protector of England, Oliver Cromwell. I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. Thanks for watching The Doctor Is In and stay safe.